thanks. So uh, they asked us, of course, to talk about the future of our field. So I'll give you a very brief introduction to some of the work that we and many others did, and, uh, and then launch into three examples of in, where we think we can make progress in the next five to 10 years. So DNA has evolved uh, the ability to sense its own integrity. And, and this is a form of uh, chemical consciousness uh, for this, this amazing molecule to have uh, evolved this ability. And um, uh, basically, what I mean by that is that it can, it can determine whether its structure has been perturbed. So if you have some sort of insult to damage, uh, to DNA, and it causes a, a damage event, um, there's a sensory network that launches into action. And, um, and there are sentinel proteins that are scouring the genome looking for structural abnormalities. And when they find one, they build a, uh, a solid state signaling apparatus. And they, they use this uh, signaling to, uh, to send out a number of different signals uh, to alert uh, various biological processes that act not only to properly repair the DNA damage, uh, but also to alert other aspects of the cell and even your own uh, other cells within your body that some event has, has occurred. So uh, once they send these signals, of course, there's a response, uh, an emergency response, and then the various problems are addressed. So um, DNA damage in a cell is actually information. And this information is transmitted into a number of different uh, ways. And, and you can see that, um, um, in particular, one of the, the, the more important events is uh, reactivating DNA replication. Because when the DNA molecule replicates, it's unwound and it's at its most uh, vulnerable uh, position. Now, there's lots of ways to think about DNA repair. Uh, and you can often imagine it as sort of like a a base that's damaged and you just cut it out and patch it up, sort of like <clears throat> filling a pothole on the road and you just smooth it out and you keep going. But then there are much more serious events. Imagine a bridge falling down. Imagine the kind of coordination you need to rebuild a bridge. You've got to get all of, all of the, the uh, different uh, uh, structures uh, rebuilt and you have to make new uh, building blocks and orchestrate the organization of when they're put, put where. And that's the kind of thing that happens when a replication fork occur, uh, damage occurs. Um, when viruses uh, replicate in your body, uh, the DNA damage response can sense that as well and send signals. It often alerts the immune system. It rewires metabolism so that you can get more building blocks to do repairs. If things go really bad, uh, it activates a cell death pathway um, using P53. But there are other things such as orchestrating the right kind of repair at the right time. Um, it maintains genomic stability. And if there is a significant amount of damage, it can cause a cell to exit the cell cycle and permanently differentiate in something that's called senescence. Now, the last three um, of these are what I'm going to focus on, because these are, these are great things for, the, for our pathway to do, but they also get in our way. Uh, so that's the... Uh, um, the issue here, are they always doing what we need, or sometimes maybe we could do without them and be better off? So the first one is, is the DNA damage response, DNA repair choices. Um, are they friends, guardian angels, perhaps, or foes? Perhaps Satan? So, um, so what do I mean by this? Well, it turns out that during the cell cycle, um, where cells are uh, duplicating their DNA here in S phase. In G1, they're not duplicated, but here you're taking it apart. It actually uh, activates different types of DNA repair pathways uh, in S phase than exist in G2. And I've illustrated these here. Um, and so in S phase, uh, cells like to do something called homologous recombination. Because they've replicated the, the two strands of DNA, you actually have that information in another chrom chromosome that's just been um, uh, synthesized. So if you have a break in the DNA, it can just copy this template and fix itself up. Uh, and this is a, called homology-directed um, repair. Uh, and that's controlled by the DNA damage response. Uh, but in G1, you don't have that template. And it uses a different pathway. 
which is uh, non-homologous end joining. And basically, this is error prone. You sometimes delete DNA or you insert, but basically you're just bashing things together. Now, why is that important? Well, it's important because now we have the ability to edit our genomes. And uh, what we uh, use now, as you all are aware of, uh, another breakthrough prize winning group um, discovered this Cas9 uh, uh, molecule and uh, the, its ability to direct double strand breaks. And so, what we would like to do to precisely edit our genome is to introduce a double strand break. Um, into DNA and then provide the, the donor template so that we can precisely make the changes we want in the DNA. Um, but the problem is, is that um, most of the cells that we wish to edit are actually in the G1 phase of the cell cycle. So uh, they don't want to do this. And, uh, and so I think in the, in the next few years, we're going to learn enough to be able to manipulate uh, this pathway and to allow uh, this homologous recombination and repair to occur in the G1 phase of, of the cell cycle, uh, where many of our stem cells reside. So um, that's particularly important, of course. Um, now, the other topic I want to cover, the second topic, is genomic stability. Now, um, um, the DNA damage response actually uh, is essential to even duplicate a cell. You can't make another cell, a mammalian cell, without this pathway. And even if you have very subtle defects in it, uh, you, can, you can get um, all kinds of developmental diseases. There are over 25 different familial diseases that are linked to defects in uh, the DNA damage response pathway. And of course, one of those uh, that's, that's uh, most well known is that uh, you get cancer. And, and genes like the the BRCA1 and BRCA2 gene, or breast cancer genes, are actually uh, in this. And this is what a normal cell looks like. And, and if you have a genomic instability, you end up with something that looks like this. Too many chromosomes, and each chromosome has its own unique color, but now you can see that some chromosomes have two or three colors because they've recombined illegitimately. So um, uh, genomic instability is a problem, but our pathway prevents that. But when it goes bad, um, um, it can cause cancer. And so I want to uh, use this analogy of a stair, of a, of a, of a stool, a four-legged stool, uh, to illustrate this. So a normal cell is very stable, uh, uh, but if you take away just part of the um, uh, DNA damage response pathway, uh, one of these legs, for example, you get a uh, unstable, unstable stool. Now, it's still a stool. You can still sit on it, but if you sit on it wrong, uh, you could just easily fall over. And so these are, these are unstable. But at this point, these remaining legs, uh, these other parts of the DNA response, DNA damage response pathway, are holding it up. So the idea here is to, um, is to now uh, get inhibitors of different aspects of, of that uh, pathway, that, such that if you take away one of these legs, a normal cell is still okay. But now a, a cancer cell will be extremely unstable and be dead. And this is uh, something that you've probably heard of called uh, synthetic lethality. So there are actually, uh, uh, in this case, uh, uh, in the case of cancer, two wrongs can make a right. And uh, there are DNA, uh, DNA damage response inhibitors, which, by the way, is a signal transduction pathway. There's a lot of kinases in it, so they're great targets. Um, um, these are in, in the clinic now to treat a variety of, of genomically unstable cancers and are showing some efficacy. So um, we hope that that's going to continue. So uh, that's uh, um, the second example. And now I'd like to, to give you a third example of uh, where our friend, the DNA damage response, is causing us trouble. So this is the senescence pathway. And, um, Senescence is a, uh, a response to DNA damage um, that um, permanently causes cells to exit the cell cycle. Now, this is really important for preventing cancer. And two of the main tumor suppressor genes, the ones that are most famous, P53 and P16, are um, the regulators of this pathway. So the DNA damage is sensed, and these two central um, transducers of information 
activate this, and these cells permanently exit the cell cycle. And this is important for tumor suppression. But they also do one other thing, and uh, it's a separate branch, um, but uh, these cells differentiate into uh, cells that actually send out lots of signals to the rest of your body, all these cytokines and chemokines and growth factors. And, um, and this is to sort of bring the immune system in and have a look to see if there's a real problem with this cell that's undergoing um, DNA damage, maybe a virus is infected in it, uh, infected it or something like that. And so inflammation occurs. Now, this inf inflammation actually, though, has a downside, and that is that uh, it's been linked to aging and age-associated diseases. And we know that almost all diseases that we suffer from are um, um, <clears throat> much worse as we age. And so the process of aging itself is um, tremendously important uh, to understand, and if, if there's some way that you can make inroads into that, um, that ends up being uh, something that could have a large impact on human health. So um, it turns out that as animals age, senescent cells accumulate. And this is due to uh, a combination of factors, uh, one of which is accumulating DNA damage due to oxidative stress. Another is uh, shortening telomeres because somatic cells don't have telomerase to continuously um, uh, lengthen their telomeres uh, like many um, stem cells do. And so these cells accumulate over time. And uh, this is just one example of work from our lab. So one of the genes that we found uh, to be uh, turned on to activate this um, um, secretory phenotype is called GATA4. And it gets turned on along with this other gene, P16, the tumor suppressor I to told you about a moment ago. And this is just an immunofluorescence experiment of uh, uh, young and old human brains. So these are about the age of, say, a graduate student, perhaps. And, and the old ones are, you know, an emeritus professor or maybe me, uh, but I wasn't the donor here. And you can see that in, um, in young brains, uh, you can see the, the, the DNA stain here shows there's lots of cells here, but these proteins aren't expressed. But in the old brains, they're turned on uh, to very high levels. And so we know that um, as we age, neuroinflammatory processes occur that can complicate lots of neurodegenerative diseases, um, and so this is a problem. So, and this is occurring not just in the brain, but throughout your entire body. So your body's becoming highly um, inflammatory as, as uh, you grow older. Um, and recently, uh, there was an important experiment done uh, in, in the lab of uh, Jan uh, Van, Van Dusen, uh, who used a genetic trick in a mouse to kill off senescent cells. So, um, and uh, he was able to then look at these mice to see if it had any effect on lifespan. And this, is, uh, this just shows the, the curve. So this is a mouse, a normal mouse with normal senescent cells, and this dark line here, and this is just a survival curve. And this is the mouse, the same mouse now, uh, of the same strain, lacking senescent cells. They've just been given a drug to kill off the senescent cells. And what you can see is that they live longer. And even the maximum lifespan has is, is changed a little bit. But mostly, uh, it's about a 27 to 30 percent extended lifespan. So the idea is that if we could do this for humans, we may be able to impact uh, aging. And, and they also measured lots of different aspects of aging um, in these mice, and they age more slowly. So you can imagine, you know, this is the James Dean mouse. You don't have to die young to leave a good-looking corpse. You could probably go a little bit longer. Um, so, um, so the idea here is to to build these drugs that can either kill senescent cells or prevent uh, this branch of the pathway. Now, senescent cells, since they're everywhere, you're going to kill them presumably everywhere if you do that. And so one question is, what happens to the cells in the brain? And that is a big issue for people in the senolytics field, they call it, who want to make something that's going to kill uh, senescent cells, and if you do do something like that, if this drug attacks your brain, that's a problem, I think, because in, in, our, in our examples, we found that um, 
And 70% sometimes of neurons are actually uh, senescent. Now, you have the blood-brain barrier to kind of help you, but we'll see. My guess is this branch of the pathway is going to be more fruitful for, um, for interfering with. So, um, uh, so this anti-senescent therapies, are, I think, are really part of the future and how this pathway can really impact human health to keep us uh, keep on keeping on. So thank you very much. We have time for a few questions uh, can be for the audience. I'm just wondering why the stem cells that are quiescent are in G1 rather than G2. It would make more sense for them to be in G2 so if they get damaged, they can do homologous repair themselves. But you implied that most of them are in G1. Yes. Um, and, well, it's just a fact. Uh, why that is, uh, it's not clear, but I think it's a, it's a point in the cell cycle that you can arrest cells, and they enter, they're quote-unquote quiescent at that point. And um, <clears throat> it's actually uh, less dangerous than replicating. And uh, you, you still deal with certain types of damage, like oxidative damage and things like that, but you don't have replication forks potentially um, uh, having a problem. Uh, and, and so, you know, you could potentially stay in G2, but that's not how they evolved, so. Maybe in the future when we re-engineer ourselves, we can get there. Great. Well, thank, thank you. you.